in the mental health field too often. We've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. The landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Okay, welcome back, everybody, to It's Not Just in Your Head. So we have this like awkward, sad problem of Harriet's not here today simply because of tech issues that we were not able to troubleshoot and we're like it we're like 30 minutes into the time we were supposed to record and it's like a long story and it's really annoying and we just weren't able to fix it but um but so Maria and I are just gonna we're just gonna do it like solo and for a shorter episode to discuss what we were gonna discuss so so Maria Dong um she is here with me um to discuss healthcare and being a healthcare worker and what the problems are within the system um just from her personal experience, my personal experience, it was going to be Harriet's experience. Um, Maria had reached out to us, uh, or technically we kind of reached out to you, Maria, I think on Twitter, right? But um, just you'd been a listener of the podcast and you'd heard some of our discussions about the healthcare system. Um, You know, we were talking about it from mental health and then we were, Harriet has, I think, a really, really good way of talking about like um, the larger scale issues with like hospitals, insurance companies, doctors, like in our early, earlier episodes. Right. Um, and something in our discussions about the healthcare system, I think seemed to resonate with you from your experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So actually it was some of the discussions about what the system does to providers and not just, um, patients, because we talk a lot about patients and I think a lot of people are aware that it's terrible for patients. It doesn't have good outcomes. It's expensive. Um, it's painful, (laughs) but it's dehumanizing. But, um, I think one of the things that isn't recognized, uh, particularly because of a lot of this discussion of like, oh, healthcare heroes and whatnot, is how actually terrible it is for providers themselves. Um, it's like this giant meat grinder where you spend a lot of money um, and work really, really hard to get into the field. And then because of that, you're kind of manipulated throughout like all stages of the system. And most, a lot of people burn out very, very quickly and leave. And we've seen that a lot in um, occupational therapy. So I'm an occupational therapist. And uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of schools now. It's rapidly expanding, and the um, the progression for the degree has gotten uh, much more complicated. It used to be a bachelor's, uh, then it was a master's, and we're actually just now moving into requiring a doctorate for everyone uh, to enter the right. field, which is a huge barrier for entry. Very expensive. Um, and then people, of course, get into their first jobs, their second jobs. They go through this like really dystopian experience of um, you know being asked to work off the clock and bend ethics and uh, kind of working for, um, trying to do things better for the patient, but also beholden to like the insurance and the hospital right. and the nursing home and, you know, whoever else. And then they wind up burning out and leaving, yeah. um, and being replaced with another, uh, new provider. So yeah. I just, I remember it was very traumatic for me, that whole experience. And I, I the, one of the very first episodes, uh, I think Harriet was talking about, you know, how providers are trapped in the system just as much as uh, patients are. Right. And I really resonated with that and tweeted about that. And someone reached out to me. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we, I think we should probably revisit some of that. Um, those were, those are good discussions we had earlier on. Um, I mean, so what, what were your experiences? I mean, if it was like too traumatic, you don't have to get into like excruciating detail. Yeah, but no. Um, yeah. Uh, so my first, so, um, <clears throat> so of course I went to school. Um, I had a number of field works, which are like, um, they're like, pay- they're unpaid internships, right? Uh, you do like six months of unpaid internships working full time. Um, I did an inpatient rehab. Um, I've done some stuff in outpatient with seating. Um, I got my first job, which was in a nursing home, which is, is, and was like one of the most horrific experiences of my life. And, even now, when I look back at it, I have such complicated feelings because it was also one of the only nursing homes that accepts, um, like, you know, people who don't have money, like right out of the gate. So a lot of these people, if this nursing home didn't exist, would have nowhere to go or would have had nowhere to go. But at the same time, uh, the, the experience was like, I still have nightmares about it, you know? And then, um, I actually got out of that and went into outpatient thinking things would be a lot better. I got into this very like shiny, hospital system with a very prestigious job doing hand and lymphedema therapy. And um, it was better in the sense of like, I wasn't seeing as much constant suffering, but that corporate grind is never ending. And it's completely antithetical to being able to practice, you know, healthcare in a, in a, in a way that doesn't kind of destroy your own personal ethics. So um, if you want specific examples, I can talk about that or I can, you know, whatever um, I think, whatever you think would be the most useful. Well, maybe like from a, so, uh, yeah, it's so it. I feel you, 
and and because the with our, our the conversation we were having before we recorded of like when I, you know I was rambling about like the documentation, and then you were kind of saying like yeah the documentation stuff sucks, and then the, there's all these like weird uh, nonprofit politics or or the corporate politics. I'm sure they look almost identical, funding yeah. source complications and everything. I mean, I guess I guess maybe from a zoom out view, and I know Harriet wanted to ask you this as well, and like you yeah. know you don't, you don't have to like pretend to be some mega expert or something, but I mean sure. For, like maybe maybe from a zoom out view, like why does the system work this way, and what would be better, or is that too big? <laughs> no, I mean like I thought about I because um you did email this question and I was like oh my god right like they're you know like like I said the best minds of our generation are really sure you know debating this um, yeah. I think that we know like we like if you ask you know, uh, a relatively representative sample of like top minds in the field. Like everybody knows that a single payer model um, and a model where, you know, healthcare is not a profit industry or a corporate industry is probably uh, the best way. We have real world data from other countries. It's not like we're just inventing this new thing and then, you know, making a bunch of theoretical um, assumptions about it. Like we, we know this, we can see it. Um, as far as like how to get our system into a better place before we make that leap, I do think there are a lot of uh, incremental steps that we could possibly take to start moving things in the right direction. I've thought a lot about this, particularly in the context of like um, elder care. Um, a lot of people don't realize that if you get old and sick, if you don't have like a like a very uh, significant uh, traumatic adverse event, so like a fall or a stroke or something, right. your your care in like a nursing home is not considered part of your health care, right? Like there's this whole system that's set up that essentially is designed to drain every single piece of the money that you have acquired over your entire life out of you and back into this corporate system. Mm. Um, one of the things that was really in interesting for me actually with this latest uh, infrastructure bill that's being talked about is the idea of incorporating uh, elder. I know I'm just like rambling. There's so many pieces, oh, right? Please but, ramble. Um, yeah, go for it incorporating uh, elder care into this. And I think people don't realize this, right? They think that I'm going to get old and then, you know, the insurance that I've you know, procured will pay for me. And that's not actually how um, any of this works. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I actually, I made a list of like, like little steps to get us to those bigger steps, mm -hmm. right? So for example, I wrote down direct to consumer marketing needs to stop, right? Like, yeah. um, we need to stop seeing, even inside of the hospital, you walk around inside of a hospital and there's constant advertisements. Right before I left my um, outpatient job, they were installing these huge advertising screens that were supposedly like to inform you more about your health situation and like things to talk to your doctor about, but were actually just uh, advertising and they were actually tracked. I remember I unplugged one at one point because I was working with a patient who had had a stroke and couldn't focus. And mm. so of course it was very important to be able to kind of isolate that environment down a little bit more. And someone actually came down from IT and told me I had to plug it back in. That we were making money uh, off of it being plugged in and it needed to be plugged in at all times. And I was mm. just, you know, absolutely livid. It's not like that person had consented to that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Obviously, director consumer marketing is uh, something that needs to be stopped. But, I think. but how how else will I know what's wrong with me and what meds <laughs> I need to fix myself if we don't have direct well, to consumer marketing? Am I supposed to like I don't, ask a doctor I guess you, <laughs> for, for something? <laughs> <Right>? or, like, <laughs> well, it's also really that just seems infuriating. Weird to me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, you know, we, we have this culture where we expect our healthcare providers to all get advanced degrees, even though they're largely, they're, I mean, like occupational therapy and, and physical therapy and speech therapy in many countries is a bachelor's degree, because if it takes two and a half years to do the classes necessary to get that degree, then you don't actually have to get a, you know, bachelor's in something else. And then that, that degree, you could just start there, but we'll mm -hmm. go, that's not important right now. My point is that mm -hmm. these people are highly trained. Um, you know, I, I had a very intensive education. Um, I've spent countless hours, you know, reading research and in laboratories and doing clinical hours and mm -hmm. like tons of money. And I had to take this licensing exam that like people study for like six months after school for, and you get through this entire process. Uh, right. And then you're not even allowed to give your like your educated opinion. Mm -hmm. about the circumstance because it's more important to push these like uh these products or you know what, whatever right. uh the, the consumer marketing says right and uh it's it's really terrible i don't know i'm, I'm drifting yeah. again i'm so sorry but um that's definitely no, no, no. one of the you're, things you're i good. thought about yeah no we don't have to like you're not we're, you know we're not putting you on like the spot to do some like dissertation on like you know here's, here's <laughs> the policy goodness. platform and like you're running for president or some crap right <laughs> But okay, yeah, yeah, direct to consumer ad. I mean, what? So just even, just even, uh, just to zoom in on that point a little bit. I mean, what yeah, about sure. that would be? What what about that is good? Why would that be good for our healthcare? Right. System? So, um, so many of the decisions 
for what the goal is in a healthcare system are made uh, specifically by the like who who has the money essentially right so like mm -hmm. the stakeholders right now in a corporate system uh, a corporation has a legal fiscal obligation to make as much money in the short term for its shareholders as possible right shareholder right? primacy that, yeah yes that is that's their legal obligation like mm -hmm. it is enshrined in the law that's what a corporation mm -hmm. is supposed to and has to do so it's yeah. not surprising that they're going to make decisions that are not good for patients in the long term uh, if it if it creates short term stakeholder you know, shareholder profits that's what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is why it, it you know it doesn't work, um, and so instead of having outcomes like the uh, outcomes, because be, because all of healthcare has outcomes, right? Everything is constantly mm -hmm. tracked and measured, and and we use these outcomes to determine policy, like what Medicare will pay for and doesn't pay for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these outcomes are like they're lobbied for by these companies that sell us things, right? Mm -hmm. So. If, if it's an outcome that they have a product that they can make a, a change in on that outcome scale, they're going to sell that product and they're going to lobby for that product. They're going to lobby for that outcome and then the outcome becomes part of healthcare policy. So does it, um, so yeah, I, I, cause I keep trying to wrap my head around this, like, so the hegemony problem, I guess, cause this is, it's, it's, it's related, but separate, I guess, or the way, the yeah. way that we can talk about it. But like, yeah. I guess, so, cause you know, Harriet rails on this all the time of how like yeah. people, um, so for like, um, let's say like antidepressants or anti-anxiety, you know, just those like, um, like drugs yeah. that you get, you get, you go to a psychiatrist for of how, um, there's actually this sort of pro and I don't know how, like with outside of mental health, if this applies, but that like, there's actually so many consumers now. And even in this, this, this framework, I don't, I don't know how to, how to change it necessarily, but when you think like consumers and providers, right. That, that we're using market mm -hmm. language to talk about healthcare now, right. Like, I, mm -hmm. I think, I think before the eighties, that wasn't really done so much. I'm not totally sure, mm -hmm. but I think the eighties is when the sort of like, um, healthcare commodification process started from what I've read. But that yeah. the there's like an actual demand for drugs now coming from the consumer base, which also makes it harder for the healthcare providers, right? Because if you're like, oh well, right. I I saw that like Selexa is you know I saw like this lady sort of like running in slow motion in this really green field on TV, and that like Selexa <laughs> has made her happy, and she looked yeah. like a soccer mom like me, or like a you know a black single dad like me, or like a, you know whatever whatever sort of like person they're trying to like sort of you know target like in the ads and then and they're like oh yeah. That, yeah that looks like that'll probably solve my problems right so i know with 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 mental health that's certainly a thing and then so psychiatrists are also in a position and and therapists sometimes to be like well maybe i should sounds like it's pretty bad i should probably refer him to the psychiatrist at this point because also there's liability issues and like i don't want to get yeah. in trouble if they're like if they kill themselves or whatever yeah um, i'm sorry to sound so harsh about that listeners by the way no. but this is like an actual sort of systemic problem but then i mean i don't know outside of mental health do you think that's a, that's an issue as well where people already have yeah, this absolutely. idea of like oh i need so, to take some meds for this versus make lifestyle yes. changes or something like that yeah yeah, and not just that, but um, things that are profitable and are able to turn a profit in a like a, almost like a sexy way. Um, yeah, yeah. They 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 get better. Uh, people know about them more, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't even know what occupational therapy is or what it could do for you or mm -hmm. when you would go see an occupational therapist or for mm -hmm. what condition, right? Mm -hmm. um, even though a lot of research in a lot of countries shows that it's an essential, like it's an essential service, particularly for aging populations, mm -hmm. um, you know, which we are facing this situation where we're going to have a massively aging population very, very soon, right? Right, right. Um, but it's not sexy and it's not uh, commodifiable or, you know, be able to be made in a product in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not something that when you walk into your doctor, it's going to come off the top of your head. A lot of times doctors don't even know uh, what we do, right? I, mm -hmm. Part of my job in the hospital was to contact doctors and say like, hey, uh, so I did lymphedema work, for example, for a while. And um, that's, that's where you have a lot of swelling of the limb. And it's mm -hmm. usually secondary to uh, cancer treatment, but you can also see it a lot of times right. in uh, cardiovascular conditions because mm -hmm. the, as the cardiovascular vascular system eventually like, essentially gets less efficient mm -hmm. people start to get more swelling and if that swelling stays mm -hmm. in the limb for too long it, you can have these long-term changes that then cause the secondary uh, lymphedema that doesn't you know go away without treatment wow so um, it would not occur to the doctor a lot of times that there is a like a therapist in the hospital that can treat this and that it's mm -hmm. a it's a and it's a treatment technique that involves a lot of um, non 
uh, pharmaceutical treatments, right? There's like mm-hmm. massage and, and wraps and bandaging and all of these other uh, exercises, like these things that they, mm-hmm. they wouldn't think of. But you can't, it's very hard to package that or put it on a product, right? It's not like mm-hmm. ask your doctor about blah, blah, blah. And about, so like yeah, even doctors like themselves don't know about and, it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Why right. would that occur to you when like we live in a consumer society where like the answer is of course a drug? Right. And the funny thing is like, um, the treatment of lymphedema varies a lot by country. So uh, in Europe, for example, I think I mentioned this in an email, but um, mm-hmm. if you have, well, not all of Europe, obviously I can't speak for like an entire continent or whatever, but if you have lymphedema in a lot of places, they send a therapist out to your home because if you have a very consistent, um, you know, regimen of like the massage and the exercise and the wrapping, then it can resolve in as little as two weeks and you'll always have lymphedema, but it'll be much more manageable. And then it's easier for you to treat because the swelling is of course less. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't happen in the United States, right? So it's right. it's just this this whole situation of like, the diseases that get treatment are the ones that we have drugs for. And so instead of the drug, it, it's like the disease be- happens because of the drug. Like we have a name for the disease or we know about the disease because of the drug and not the other way around, I guess is a better way to put it. Okay. Wow, I'm off topic again. I'm sorry. I no, just, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> there's you're so not. much to cover. No, your brain works like mine. I have this like, I don't know if this, if this is what the term galaxy brain means, but like my, yes. my, my brain jumps to things a lot. Right. I mean, I think it's a sign, you know, it's like sort of a sign of, genius and insanity sort of, uh, you know, at the same time. Um, I also, in the morning, I call it coffee brain later in the day. It's just like, sometimes I jokingly say it's mania, um, which it maybe isn't. Well, I'm very nervous too. And that's what my brain does when I get nervous. It starts to try to see like all sides of the situation at once. And of course that's not possible and not very efficient, but that's just, that's how I react to that. So I apologize for that. No, you're good. Um, we, so I just, I realized too, just for timing. So I'm like, okay, so you, like, if you had a list and we, we went to like, you know, direct to consumer ads as a thing, but we, I think we also just sort of covered various aspects of like why direct consumer ads are, are a problem. Yeah. Um, and actually, so one, I wanted to ask you, cause I actually have never, I couldn't explain to someone in concise, accurate terms what an occupational therapist is myself. Yeah. Doctors can. And I don't you even, blame you. I should, that should yes. have been like our, my first question this to is, you. This actually. is a fun question because if you go to OT school, that's your mm-hmm. first exam. So like your very mm-hmm. first oral exam is usually to have to give an elevator pitch of the profession because uh, um, it's it's complicated to explain. And it's not, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's kind of like... Um, it's like if you had to explain what nurses do, it varies a lot based on the setting. So, uh, but the way that the elevator pitch that I came up with when I was getting my master's degree was if you take all of the things that you are expected to do, want to do, or required to do in your daily life, so you have to eat, you have to uh, bathe your body, you go to work, whatever, mm-hmm. those are all called your occupations, right? They're the way that you okay. occupy your time. And mm-hmm. if something happens to you, either you get sick or maybe it's a developmental problem, any, anything like that, um, you're not able to perform those occupations anymore. The way that Mm -hmm. you either want or need or expected to do. Mm -hmm. So an occupational therapist's job is basically to be like this jack of all trades that steps in and helps you figure out how to do those things again. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that's physical rehabilitation. And that's what we normally associate with rehab, right? We think, Mm -hmm. oh, exercises. But a lot of what OTs do is um, like home analysis Mm -hmm. or helping you with equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, Or for example, one of the things I said when we were talking about that tech problem is like, oh, does she have a checklist? Because, you know, Mm -hmm. that's like an organizing strategy. It's meeting someone where they're at and and coming working with them in this holistic way to kind of help them figure out how am I going to do the things I need to do. So that's one reason that they're so um, important in aging, yeah. right? It's because we have this very uh, multifactorial background. Most of us have a pretty strong training in neurology, psychology, um, anatomy, uh, biomechanics. Uh, we're not like like a super specialist in any one area, but having that varied background is really helpful when you have someone, for example, who uh, might be aging and is starting to get a little weaker and maybe having some memory problems and also, you know, has like they live in a rural community, for example, they don't have access to transportation. How does that yeah. person age in place? Mm-hmm. You need this person that kind of um, understands all of these different systems and is able to kind of work with that person to come up with some solutions. And uh, most of the training that we get is actually in something called activity analysis, which is breaking down how people do things. Like what are the steps involved in cooking a meal or you know, eating with a fork or getting dressed? And how do we simplify those steps in a way that makes it easier for other people to do them? So that's kind of like my very long elevator pitch as to what OTs are. It's yeah. So this this is the exact conversation I had with I think I was in like Portland talking to somebody who was like they were going to go to school to become like a psychotherapist, um, Mm -hmm. and then they 
because they were in, they were seeing a psychotherapist and they're like, this is so helpful. And I want to do this. And then they saw an OT for some reason, something had happened and they were like, hell no, I'm not going to do the, the psychotherapy thing. I'm going to do the OT thing. Cause this is like yeah. the most helpful thing I've ever come across. And, um, and they were trying to explain it to me. It was similar to you. And it actually seems like it casts such a wide net over so many yeah. different categories of yeah. human experience and suffering and functionality. I mean, I almost just that the term is actually really like psychotherapist. We know it's just like, oh, it's just there's stuff in your sort of mental inner experience that you go to someone yeah. and, you know, and like occupational therapist, I think the word occupational almost sounds like job, like, yo, oh, I'm having yeah. trouble at my job or something like that, right? Like, I almost, yeah. I almost wonder if they're, we need a rebranding or something. So but the problem is that yeah. um, occupational therapy is actually really old as a profession. Oh, so okay. um, that's that's why the word is being used. And I, I agree with you. And there's, there's this, like, you've hit this, like, you know, amazing war that occupational therapists are having all of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and, and if you translate it different languages, like in Spanish, sometimes they say terapia funcional, which is functional therapy, mm -hmm. uh, which... Mm -hmm. Kind of makes a little more sense. I was going to say functional. Yeah, that the term functional mm -hmm. came to mind because it all has to do with functional, like human Absolutely. functionality. Yeah. Yep, a hundred percent. But OTs, they've they've been around quite some time. Uh, in fact, there's an OT school uh, very close to my house in Michigan that's over a hundred years old. Um, so. Unfortunately, that it's like a term that was used a lot more to mean like how you occupy your time or how you keep right. busy or what you do during your day at the time right. that the, you know, the profession was kind of developed. Okay. Um, okay. What else did you have? I don't on disagree your... with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not, clear. I'm not like, and I'm just also to be clear, like I'm not like dissing the field or the name or whatever. It's just, no, I think it's just fine. too bad when something's really awesome and then it's hard to explain to people. It's just a, yeah. it's a crappy well, equation. It's hard to explain because of our medical model for healthcare. That's actually yeah. one of the things that yeah. makes it really hard to explain because yeah, it doesn't yeah, yeah. boil down neatly into these like, you know, medical categories, right? If you're mm -hmm. talking about someone's ability to function in their home, right. um, it having a medical condition can really like stop your ability to function or it cannot. Right. It depends on a lot of other factors. Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's also, and that's in part a hegemony problem, but it is tied up with the profit motive yes, factor of because again, like the way, cause like even when I think of a doctor, like sometimes I'll be talking to clients and they'll mention something and then it, it trigger, it flags this thing in my brain of like, Oh, refer to doctor because that's not, yeah. that's out of my scope kind of thing. Yes. Um, but like, now that I think of it, I mean, probably 70 to 90% of those things, I, I could just say, like, you might want to talk to an occupational therapist. I mean, maybe that's too specific <laughs> for me to refer to, because now that I think of yeah. what you're describing, but I think the assumption is, like, the the first go-to, like, almost the center of the network of help should be, like, a physician or a primary Absolutely. care physician. And, and then you, you talk to them, yeah. and then they refer to some kind of specialist, yep. whether it's a therapist. Yep. Uh, and also it's, 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 it's kind of problematic that like the term therapy that we have the monopoly on the term, right? Like, I don't know if that's something that y'all talk about, but that like, when I say, I'm going to go to a therapist, you don't mean yeah. typically an occupational therapist, a massage therapist, uh, some, some other kind of therapist, you mean a psychotherapist yeah. and you, and you're, and you mean talk therapy, even though there's like a dozen different types of psychotherapy. Um, yes. but it's, I mean, cause I wonder if that's even the best model, right? Like, should it be that you go to a physician and the physician decides, especially if we, I mean, I, I've, I actually had a client a couple of weeks ago say uh, that the psychiatrist, you know, psychiatrists are medical doctors. So the psychiatrist that, that she's been trying to figure out, like, how to get the right meds and stuff. Um, yeah. That, that this doc, you know, they spend 15 minutes with her on the phone and they're kind of dismissive and they are just like, okay, well, you know, keep, you know, either up the dose of these meds or we're going to switch you on these meds or we're going to add these meds. And they don't seem you know, I don't know the psychiatrist person. So I don't, and, and maybe she's just like biased or her depression is like, I don't know, clouding her judgment or something, but like, it's very possible that this doctor like doesn't give a shit. And they're just like yeah. 15 minutes. I just billed 15 minutes uh, and just got a couple hundred bucks to just tell somebody <laughs> some stupid shit. That's not going to help them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I want to jump in here really fast because yeah, yeah. Um, you actually hit two two really big things in the head. So first of all, yeah. I do want to point out that occupational therapists generally do need a physician referral. Um, there uh, are very okay. few uh, states where, for example, an OT, an OT can evaluate somebody and then mm -hmm. can then send that order to a doctor and say, hey, can you take a look at this? I think the person needs OT services, but mm -hmm. that's pretty rare. So usually right. your referral is going to come from a doctor. Um, what I would say is this is yet another way where the 
the profit motive of the healthcare system has affected its structure in such a way that it's it's bad for the patient. And what I mean by that is that general practitioners who are, th that's who people should go to see first, right? This GP that's kind of the jack of all trades and says, okay, I think you need this or this or this and sends you to a specialist. They're not they're not uh, they're not reimbursed at the same rate that a specialty profession is, uh, and they don't make as much money as specialty professions do, right? Even though they're more important in terms of uh, long-term healthcare outcomes. So we know, for example, that the dollars we put into uh, GPs returns uh, astronomically uh, to to the patient, as opposed to like say something really fancy like an ER doc that that seems like they save lives, right? But actually, yeah, yeah. the GP. That money to a general practitioner actually saves more lives in the long run because they're with these people longer periods of time. They're catching mm -hmm. things earlier. They're mm -hmm. noticing when something changes. Um, so before things really become an emergency, they're able to kind of like, you know, diagnose and route appropriately. Right. Uh, but it doesn't pay as well. And the healthcare, uh, the hospital doesn't make as much money, mm -hmm. right? So they they route a lot of their resources into these like, you know, these, these non-general practice specialties. Uh, I know that the giant mammoth healthcare system nearby me that I won't uh, call out by name. Okay. Cause like, you know, they're huge. Uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they, that's what they do. They buy up regional hospitals, they shut down the general practice and they force everyone to go to like a, a central hub for their GP, right? So your GP who Whoa. used to be your doctor down the road is now like 60 minutes away or something like that. Right. Because right. it's more efficient for them. Um, so that GP that would have been doing these referrals to these different specialty care places like occupational therapy or psychotherapy or wherever like this person may need to go is no longer accessible. And so people are now, they're kind of out of luck in that way. So I think that's very interesting that you said that because it actually like reveals this another, another level, right? So like the, the psychotherapist that makes, I don't know how much money you just said for 15 minutes of time or whatever yeah. is highly incentivized in this healthcare system over a GP that's going to spend X amount of time with you and actually hear yeah. your complaints and try to figure out where you really need to go to get help. That's wild. Um, do you, so with our, we have like three minutes, um, if I'm going to jump into the, the reading group thing, um, so you mentioned unions in one of the last emails and cause something yeah. that just came to mind for me is like, cause who, cause who decides what the sort of pay disparities are within the healthcare system generally, right? Like, why is it that like right. you said, like the ER doctor gets, you know, if we broke down the hierarchy, right? Like, I wonder if, right. if you actually had like everybody, like in theory, here's a hypothetical, right? You have everybody in a right. hospital sit in a big right. circle and as equals, right, like everybody from the janitor to the ER doctor or whatever, right? And they're just like, we throw in the middle, like what everybody gets paid. And then you have these really, I don't know, they could be intense, they could be civil, but like debates about like what people should get paid based off what they do. Do you yeah. think that the wage disparities would be the same? Do you think we'd figure out something this a little is more equal? way, way, way <laughs> larger than I could possibly yeah. answer in three minutes. <laughs> um, like beyond a doubt. What, so yeah. I guess, um, wow, okay, yeah. <laughs> so what I will say, um, because I think this is kind of central to everything, when you have a corporate structure where you're beholden to shareholders who need their, their uh, returns this quarter yeah. or this you know, this year versus um, something like a healthcare system where we should be thinking about where people are going to be at five years down the line, 10 years down the line, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, there, there can become this real like push to kick the can down the road essentially, right? Yeah. So if we can get money into our doors now and it's a lot of money now, it doesn't actually matter what happens to this patient five years from now or 10 years from now. So a yeah. lot of the salary structure and the reimbursement structure uh, that's coming from these insurers and that is, you know, the choices that these hospitals are making about how they're going to spend money uh, specifically has to do with like when is the cost going to be paid is it now or later when do we have to pay this person is it now or later and a surgeon who is really flashy uh, will take money in now and this will be a return now and if this person you know dies five years later of xyz it doesn't actually matter because we're just going to fill this person with another patient they're interchangeable that's the fastest three minute like <laughs> all i can yeah. do like um, so <laughs> Yeah. I mean that maybe maybe we could have a whole separate uh, conversation on that another time. But I, I mean, because there, I don't know if you listened to the one we had with NUHW National Union of Healthcare Workers. But I mean, there are unions in big hospitals at this point. Not every yeah. hospital, yeah. but it's sort of a growing. You know, yeah. Jane McAlevey, the like sort of all star labor organizer, kind yeah. of extraordinaire, talking about stuff today is is mainly talking about hospitals. So definitely, like you know, the union movement has entered hospitals. Yeah. I mean, it's been there for a it's, while. It's very difficult because uh, yeah. healthcare, I think, very much is moving uh, toward this gig gigification model. Right. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot of like temp work and staffing and flex in, flex out, and when you don't have a stable workforce, it's much harder harder to organize. Right. right? So. Um. Oh. <laughs> 
Sorry. I know like, you got to go. No, so. no, no, it's fine. Also, I'm just going to share it because this is really funny. My girlfriend just sent me a text. I think Harriet tried to call me again. Um, that she, I, I called Harriet from my girlfriend's phone one time because my phone was dead, and then she calls my girlfriend's phone sometimes. That's just a fun fact. Just a little I love that. Easter egg for listeners to say, oh, that's a funny, weird yeah. um, TMI in the podcast. Okay, so I'm sorry we had to cut it short, and it was just no, like a, a generally short episode, Maria, but um, – is there anything that you'd want to like plug, uh, I don't know, like a link for people to go to, to know more about some of the things you're talking about or to, uh, oh, for people okay. To you hit, know what? Actually, there is one, there's one disorder that I would like to talk about really briefly, which is okay. lymphedema, which I mentioned earlier. Okay. Within right? 30 so, seconds. <laughs> within 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. I would like to say that if you're noticing a lot of swelling that's occurring in one of your limbs or more of your limbs, that's not oh. going away and it's impairing your function. Um, ask your doctor about lymphedema. No, I'm kidding. But like, <laughs> you know, you may want to do some research and see if that sounds like something that could be happening to you because it's very, yeah. very common and it's very, very disabling and there are treatments available. Uh, that don't necessarily involve taking drugs if you don't want to. Okay. Awesome. Good plug. And I forgot to say this earlier. So a big thank you and shout out to our patrons first winter, Sarah Turner, Rebecca Johns, Justin Harper, and of course, Liam for helping with the editing and social media. If you want to email us, um, it's not just in your head at gmail.com. If you want to support the podcast and become a patron, patreon.com slash it's not just in your head. And Maria Dong, thank you so much for this conversation. This is great. We should talk more in the future. And uh See you later. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. Capitalism Hits Home is a sort of broader over overhead view. It explores the way that capitalism shapes our personal lives, our psyches, our relationships, our families, and it looks particularly at the sea change in American personal life as all Americans, but the top 10 or 20 percent of Americans, have our security and our chance for a future become as precarious as it always was for minorities and families headed by women. It's not just in your head and capitalism hits home are definitely complimentary. And if listeners would like to check out Capitalism Hits Home, Harriet, where should they go to find it? Either on YouTube or Democracy at Work or on my own website, harrietfraud.com.